And so it is now my absolute pleasure to introduce one of my fellow DEI Leadership Council uh, members, uh, which who I introduced before, and none other than Jason Holt. So Jason, please take it away. Thank you so much, Jackie, and good morning to everyone. I have been given the distinct pleasure, no, better, I've been given the distinct honor of introducing a person who was an icon in the African-American business community, a person of enormous, I mean, huge, huge stature, a giant who cast a shadow uh, second to none. Bear in mind that if you're looking for a major league player, you don't stop at the little league part. You go straight to the African-American Chamber of Commerce. And if you're lucky, like we are today, you'll get a marquee player. And this marquee player is the founder, the president, and CEO of the African-American uh, Chamber of Commerce. His bio is attached to your program materials but <clears throat> I'm going to pick out just a few highlights to read to you. He is a board member and former chairman of the board for the National Black Chamber of Commerce. He was appointed to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. He's on the board of directors for the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia's Economic Community Advisory Council. He's on the Investors Bank Board of Directors. He's on the Hackensack Meridian Health Board of Directors. He is the founder and chairman of the New York State Black Chamber of Commerce. He's a board member of the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, the New Jersey BPU, and the Supplier Diversity Development Council. ROI acknowledged him as the number one person of color in New Jersey. He was acknowledged in the South Jersey Journal's list of 25 most influential African Americans in New Jersey. Uh, wow, I, I don't even, I can't keep going because we'll be here for the first hour just reading off his accomplishments. He has a degree from Fairleigh Dickinson University and he was recently awarded an honorary doctorate degree by his alma mater, but by far, his most important accomplishment is that of dad. He is the father of three sons, John Jr., Joshua, and Justin. So without further interruption, I give you one of the most entrepreneurial-minded people in New Jersey, Dr. John E. Harmon. Thank you, John, for joining us. Well, Jason, uh, thank you for that uh, you know, overwhelming and gracious introduction. Um, I just thank God for all that he's enabled me to be a part of and his um, inspiration, guidance, and direction has enabled me to um, be the person that I am today. So I want to thank you for being a part of today's program, the coordination, and also to Michelle Sekirka, a longtime co-laborer here in New Jersey and um, the many professionals over at NJBIA. Just want to thank you all for hosting uh, what I deem one of the most important topics of our day. And, um, and for those who were um, talking earlier, I thought you gave a great presentation. And um, I think collectively, we just have to continue to press on. Um, I'm going to be scripted today. I, I, I got a lot of notes here because this is something that I can go on and on about. Um, a lot of passion, a lot of focus, but we have to remain on schedule today, so I, I promise to do that. I just shot it down the time. But DE and I um, did not just start um, in recent years. Um, we're going to take you back just a little bit and kind of bring you forward and close on some, some data points that I think will make the case. But if you go back to um, 1863, when Abraham Lincoln uh, freed the slaves, um, just pause on that for a second. And, um, DE and I is all about uncomfortable conversations that could potentially lead to transformation. So in 1863 or thereabouts, um, there were two 
former slaves, one of the former slaves, one of the son of a slave arrived at the White House and engaged President Lincoln in a discussion about what they thought would be helpful in him being successful in the Civil War. And that was to um, enlist 170,000 slaves. And as a result, they brought forth the victory. And now we have these United States. Um, a few days ago, the nation recognized Juneteenth. Um, 1865, there were over 200,000 people that were enslaved after the Emancipation Proclamation which declared that everyone was free. But if we go back to Lincoln's example, bringing in non-traditional players, if you will, um, to participate in a war where they were high stakes, they brought these individuals in and they were victorious. Just want to start with a historical background about this. It's all about trying to get or maximizing the value proposition to accomplish your objectives. You know, I've been a chamber executive now 25 years. I founded the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey 15 years ago as an advocate on behalf of 1.2 black residents and over 80,000 black businesses on issues of education, health, workforce, and business while fostering relationships within the public, private, and community sectors to advance strategies that improve the competitiveness of New Jersey. My goal today is to challenge you to ask yourself why many have not fully embraced strategies to leverage DEI as an effective strategy to improve innovation, efficiency, profitability, and sustainable outcomes. New Jersey is home to over 9 million people and has been recognized as one of the most diverse states in the country. Our neighbor to the north, New York, has over 20 million people. However, when you contrast the two states, New York has implemented policies and strategies that in 2021 produced 3.2 billion in public contract to minority and women-owned businesses, as well as its banned proxies for automobile insurance premiums, proxies like education, credit score, occupation. While New Jersey has not implemented policies to incentivize contracting with minority and women owned businesses to produce outcomes like New York State, nor has our home state banned the use of discriminatory practices to derive better auto insurance premiums. The murder of George Floyd that was aired on live television served as an awakening for some and a challenge to others to explore ways to achieve an impactful coexistence, not only in New Jersey, but throughout the United States. The national strategy, tragedy led to an outpouring of resources targeted to improve the economic standing of Blacks through grants, to career and contract opportunities, to educational scholarships, four seats, corporate citizenship investment for some. This was a way of writing a long wrong. However, for EY, a major consulting company, embracing DNI with intentionality could lead to transformational outcomes. They call it the case for diversity. According to EY, Companies with diverse talent and leadership have a strong competitive advantage. By focusing on DEI, leading organizations are driving innovation, improving their brand, and impacting their bottom line, all while creating a more accepting and engaging workforce. Here's some statistics. They're saying plus 57% better team collaboration plus 19% greater retention, plus 45% more likely to improve market share, plus 70% more likely to have success in new markets. 10-point higher revenue growth, 
six point higher growth margins. So if you just step back a second, as business leaders, as folks who come to work every day trying to produce more shareholder value, more out, better outcomes, you would think if these, day, if these data points are true, everyone will be flocking to kind of um, you know, quickly figure this out. A little more information. The City Global Perspective and Solutions, GPS, report entitled, Closing the, the Racial Inequality Gaps, the U.S. Cost of Black Inequality in the U.S. It posts the loss of GDP as systemic and societal racism and discrimination faced by Blacks over the last 20 years contribute to about $16 trillion. This loss includes gaps in wages, access to housing, higher education, and the investment in Black-owned businesses. The report also provides recommendations the public and private sector can take to help close the gap. Closing the Black racial wealth gap 20 years ago might have provided an additional $2.7 trillion in income available for consumption and investment. Improving access to housing credit might have added an additional 770,000 Black homeowners over the last 20 years, with the combined sales and expenditures adding another $218 billion to GDP over that time. Facilitating increased access to higher education, college, graduate, and vocational schools for Blacks might have bolstered lifetime incomes that in the aggregate sum to 90 to $113 billion. Providing fair and equitable lending to Black entrepreneurs might have resulted in the creation of an additional $13 trillion in business revenue over the last 20 years. That could have been used for investment in labor, technology, capital equipment, and structures. 6.1 million jobs might have been created per year. The report also outlines several steps that government, corporations, and individuals can take to improve outcomes, including the following. I'm going to put, I'm going to forego government today. You know, government is just so interesting. So we're going to talk some, some potential um, uh, recommendations for corporations. Support initiatives from the top, and it was spoken about and left earlier. Initiate a focus on diversity and inclusion at the top of the house with senior management and percolating that view down the ranks. Address racial gaps in hiring, retention, retention, and firing. Implement policies that are more conscious of addressing racial gaps in hiring, retention, and firing. Engage in corporate social responsibility. Take direct action by bolstering external communities and supporting minority-owned firms. Dismantle structural barriers to hiring Black talent. Engage fully with fair chance hiring to encourage the hiring of qualified job applicants with criminal histories. For individuals, use education as a pathway for advancement. Parents can advocate for greater accountability uh, from and funding for local schools, while students can focus on job relevant skills, including STEM, problem solving, teamwork, and communication. And lastly, you know, don't ask, don't get. Advocate for one's career. Seek men mentors, advocates, and sponsors while creating, while I'm sorry, considering relocating to increase job prospects or starting one's own business. Embrace delayed gratification and risk. Increase financial literacy as a, an avenue for financial independence. Include investing in the stock market. You know, we at the African American Chamber of Commerce of New Jersey and New Jersey Business and Industry will welcome the opportunity to assist you with the, recruit, with the recruitment of Blacks for career opportunities, for vendor opportunities, for board seats, and for corporate citizenship investment in underperforming communities. 
At the end of the day, our collective ability to be laser focused on DEI as a transformational pathway to make our state more competitive can be a model for, for the country and even for the world. I'll close with this. Blacks have the highest poverty, the highest unemployment here in the state of New Jersey. Our net worth is about $5,900 versus $315,000 for whites. Here again is an opportunity to keep those numbers, those statistics in front of you and coalesce strategies in partnership with NJBIA and the African American Chamber of Commerce to mitigate those underperforming numbers. I thank you for this opportunity and look forward to continue to engage with you on a pathway forward for all of us. Thank you. So John, it is so good to see you again. I wish we were in person. We run into each other at FDU a lot and yes. out in community. So I, I just have to say that your work is so critically important and your work that you started clearly from birth, right? Yeah. And just the, the experience that you share with us is just incredible. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. What gives you hope that we are heading in the right direction. Well, I, and I, I'm sure Michelle could uh, relate to this. Being the head of a, a business organization, you have to always be optimistic. And, and, and if we use our past as a, um, uh, not only as a reflection point, but uh, um, something that has confirmed what I'm about to say, we have had great, tumult in, New Jersey, in the United States as a whole, but we've also had a great triumph. And when folks um, get focused on trying to move forward in, in a meaningful way, there's nothing but optimism. When you see people coming together, um, the past should never be forgotten. The past should always be used as a reference point of how we can do better. And some people shy away from the history because history has some some very dark stories, but nonetheless, uh, you know, they say that the darkest point is just before light. And so I would say to you, Jackie, that I'm optimistic because being, I think being optimistic is a lot more <laughs> productive. Um, your, your, your stress level is down, notwithstanding some of the headwinds that you have to face. So I think we can do this. Um, the numbers say that, uh, we're better together, and we just have to come to our, in our own time, in our own way, to embrace that. And I think we'll we'll have some bigger smiles together down the road. Well, John, you and I are very optimistic people, <laughs> and we're also very verbal and talkative people that know how to <laughs> make our feelings known. Right? What advice would you give to individuals or groups of mm. individuals who? just don't have that, I'm just going to say it um, mentality. I just need to speak it because really that's the only way we're going to learn. We're not mind readers, right? So John, what is your advice for these quieter people than you and I? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think through this whole conversation that DE and I, there's something there for everybody, right? And within everyone, there's a value proposition. And sometimes you have to have to find it and to pull it out. But everyone has a stake in the game here. Uh, everyone can contribute. And we have to find a way um, in, in your own time to figure that out. Sometimes you have to have quiet walks and quiet talks with yourself about who you are, that man or the woman in the, in the mirror. What do you want your legacy to be about? Where, where, where's your value, where's your relevance to that conversation? Could you have something to add? The last thing I'll say is, as uh, the, those, those who are grappling with how to get started and participate in this whole D and, D and I, you first you gotta acknowledge as you look around the room, you must acknowledge that something is, is, is a little, little different here. And, and that's the first thing. And then if, you, there's your, if your desire is to change that, just going from zero to one, you don't have one, 
black or brown employee or one woman, get the first. If you've never contracted with a black or brown or woman, get the first and, and then build from there. You can't go from zero to a thousand overnight. But if the data is accurate and the data is saying through diversity, equity, inclusion, there are a multitude of favorable outcomes. If you're in business, if you exist in society, you must pursue that. Your children, many of you have children. I think the children are a great example. Their friends versus our friends. When you grew up, what did your circle look like? And what does your, your, your children's circle look like today? I would dare you to admit that it's quite different. Yeah, we can learn from our young people, right? Even, even the very, very innocent toddlers, they are so innocent, so open and so loving. Um, but I love your advice, John, baby steps. This is, this is a big problem and a big issue and a huge challenge and not one that's going to be overcome overnight. So question for you from the audience. Yes. What do you, what do you think is missing in corporate outlooks on DEI? You know, uh, most uh, corporations and all small businesses, they tend to start with people they know. Uh, so I started business today. I know my buddy Bob. Is a, is a good numbers guy. I know my friend Sarah, she's a good um, marketing person. And these are this very subject approach to starting. These are people I know, I'm comfortable with, I trust them, they do well. But they may not necessarily be the best, okay? And so as a leader, you're always challenging your team to be better, but also you have to be open to exploring other possibilities. Being successful in business is all about taking some risks. And so I would say that's one of the things, you gotta be a little more objective and less subjective to ultimately get where you're trying to go in this game. Great advice, great advice. So you, you wanna touch on you know, when, when a team leader is, uh, looking at their team and they have a challenge or an issue or a project can you touch a little bit on diversity of thought that you never imagined was in the room yeah I, I, you know just from the baseline people have people come to the table with different cultural experiences right and different perspectives on things and so having the, that diverse thought leadership something may derive from that conversation that you weren't even thinking about. Um, I was with a, uh, a friend of mine who happens to be a very successful Caucasian businesswoman. And um, it was she, her son, and her son's fiance and I. Um, we were just sitting around at a golf course having a casual conversation. And she was saying, she asked the question to me, John, post George Floyd, why do you think the corporations and the philanthropists are having this big outpouring of resources? And, you know, where does that stem from? And I paused and I said, well, I have a thought. I said, um, post George Floyd's murder, you had not only black people protesting, you had old, young, you had different demographics of people from different walks of life. But I believe some of that started right at the dining room table when the parents who may be senior executives, CEOs, et cetera, were confronted with some hard questions from their children. And they may have said, well, I have a friend, Raheem is my friend, and uh, Shatara, or, uh, you know, ethnic names that are probably non-traditional to that household. And they're challenging their parents to say, you know, these are my friends. I love them. I hang out with them. And what, was, what we just witnessed on television was wrong. 
And so I think the murder of George Floyd was all about value. His life was in value. You know, black people were listed as chattel in, formal, in the formation of the United States. So that narrative has been perpetuated throughout existence. And so I think the young people challenged their parents and then their parents went into the offices the next day and said, we need to change our ways here. And this is not about just throwing money at this. This is about uncomfortable conversations. Yeah, don't leave the resources out, but be very intentional and structured and strategic about putting forth strategies. We talk about more diverse boards. We talk about more diverse supply chains, more diverse workforce, um, corporate citizenship investment in underperforming communities with high unemployment, upskilling, and so on and so forth. So kind of a long answer, but these are examples where people can just look at themselves and look at their environment, look at their circles and say, well, well hmm. I might, I might have to think about this a little differently. Mm. I love that response. And I love the, the fact that you brought up empathy yeah. that occurred. And it is up to us to make sure that that empathy does not disintegrate. <laughs> that, that care, right? Yeah. That care yeah. that we all should, regardless of who yes. we are or who we are, yes. who we want to be, we make sure that that stays afloat. So That's we cool. have an F, uh, a question from a fellow FDU person. Anita Rivers would like to know, how can we move the dime from chatter to action and require CEO to clean up crews to roll up their sleeves to get things moving along? Thanks, Anita. I think, I think that's an excellent question. Um, Michelle Sikirka is not only a friend, but she's an amazing leader. She oversees an organization that, you know, over 20,000 businesses or so are members of um, New Jersey business and industry. The African American Chamber of Commerce, we have about, you know, between eight and 900 members. Our collective leadership on this issue to coalesce conversations with those who have the resources, opportunities, and information is, is, is a way of getting to. Uh, getting a response to Anita's question. You know, there's a lot of motion, but very little action. Uh, but we've started something here, working with, with, with Michelle. And so the two of us have to continue to drive this conversation right. and engage those who are receptive. You know, there, there, there could be a lot more people here today, but we can't worry about that. <laughs> we must engage those that are here and try to move forward with them in a meaningful way. Hmm. Reflect on ourselves and keep ourselves moving and make sure yeah. we, uh, we hold ourselves accountable to not only knowledge, we but have take to be action. Because we can control what we can control. We can't control what everyone else does, but we Amen. certainly, and hold on to that. All right, so one more quick question. Um, is there some commonality between post-Civil War Reconstruction and where we find ourselves today? You know, history has a way of repeating itself, right? We talked about the Civil War and how Black slaves were used to be victorious there. You know, and you, you move from 1865 to 1900. Um, Booker T. Washington established the Negro Business League as a vehicle to educate and talk about free enterprise and capitalism, created 40 chapters between Maryland and Texas. And we've adopted that model at the National Black Chamber. And, and so I would say that our chamber is, is, is a descendant, if you will, from Booker T. Washington's vision. In 1912, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce was established as a, now the large business federation in the world. Um, Booker T. Washington was an advisor to President Taft, who, who established the U.S. Chamber. In 1921 or so, we established um, Black Wall Street. Many of those who came up through Booker T. Washington's teaching moved over to the Tulsa, Oklahoma area and started businesses. They started um, 
all types of businesses, banks, hospitals, post offices, restaurants, funeral homes. They had a thriving, a very thriving community. And then folks, based on the lie, burned down the entire community, killed a lot of people. But we've come a long way since then. President Obama was the first black president elected. Uh, so through all that turmoil and some triumph, we went, we, we went back, we came forward, we went back, and now we're, we're, we appear to be revisiting a pathway forward. How can we move forward together? And this is why we cannot discard history. We must take those lessons and, and tweak them and, and amend them in a way that works today. And, and you cannot just discard history as some folks want to do. Uncomfortable conversations can lead to a better path forward. John, you are a walking history book, and I'm ashamed of what I don't know after your presentation. I want to thank you so very much for all that you have shared with us today. Just powerful, powerful presentation, and I look forward to continuing all of our work together because we have to hold ourselves accountable. So, John, thank you so very much. Well, I thank you all for this opportunity. Michelle, Jason, keep her brother on the list. <laughs> and um, I, if I'm available, I'm here. <laughs> keep a sister too, all right? <laughs> all right. Have John, a great day. Take care. Thank you so very much.